money, big prizes. I love it. Well, howdy, outlaws. We got a lot to cover in today's news segment since I owe y'all a few weeks worth of enjoyable news content. And I still have a Destiny 2 specific Gambit Twab video to put up today, as well as an overdue content video regarding the Ewok Festival of Love event and SWG Legends, which, you know, came requested. But with that, on to the news. Let's get this out of the way. So are we getting a little tired of crowdfunding games? Do they really work? As of December 2021, the success rate of fully funding a crowdfunded project was only 39.37%. Not even half the projects ever make it to fruition. This is across everything that's crowdfunded, by the way. Of those, only 40.89% of video game campaigns are successful. Most of these are on Kickstarter. In spite of success of games like Pillars of Eternity, Faster Than Light, and Elite Dangerous, the number of complete flops or incomplete games that have been dependent on crowdfunding outweighs the number of those that have been successful. And if $5.73 billion have gone into successfully launched projects, then over $7 billion, not including untold millions unaccounted for, have gone to unsuccessful ones. At this very moment, Star Citizen has raised $438,505,369 American US dollars, backed by 3.5 million citizens and is not included in either the successful or unsuccessful metrics because it's not an officially completed project and it's not been recognized as such. Even after a decade in development, the game is nowhere near finished, still not well optimized, still doesn't seem to have a clear coherent vision outside of being purely a sandbox simulator, it's changed partnerships, game engines, been in and out of lawsuits, controversy, and innumerable concerns from those who both play and don't play the game. Chris Roberts and company have more than once waffled on roadmaps, at one point even having a roadmap of a roadmap, and now they're ceasing tentative dates on the roadmaps because they, because apparently these followers see them as definite commitments. Well, fucking duh, Cloud Imperium. I mean, every time they've been criticizing for blowing deadlines in the past, their default response has been to crutch on the old, it's a complex project and timelines are not always guaranteed to be met. Well, no fucking kidding. Maybe if that's the case, you should never leave false promises out there to begin with. Target dates are fine, with the disclaimer that development complications may cause a shift in release impact. But stop putting dates on your roadmaps. Aim for a general quarter or an end of year release. But for how distracting the loud fans seem to be, Cloud Imperium keeps doing a really good job of proving them right. And since a particular expectation has been set for the last 18 months, the loud community demographic is liable to shift from the roadmap watchers to some of the more even-keeled community who just want some transparency from the developers whose wallets they're continuing to pad. You ever know a crowdfunded game that's been so long in the tooth in development and it's so sketchy in its practices that you want to just set up an intervention for your friends who just can't seem to stop giving the money? You know how much I sacrifice? Yeah, Star Citizen is definitely that game for me. On to yet another crowdfunded monstrosity. You ever heard of something called Titan Reach? Do you know its lead developer allegedly used its crowd funds to gamble on crypto and buy a Tesla? Sound a little bit like some of the things Chris Roberts has been accused of doing? Yeah. So yeah, Titan Reach was supposed to be a RuneScape-esque MMO that started off on Kickstarter in 2020 with a goal of raising about $430,000. Square Root Studios adopted a month-to-month -month crowdfunding model not entirely unlike the way pledges were released for Star Citizen. Unfortunately, the game only managed to draw about a little under half that goal, and its lead developer, going by the moniker Unravel, shelved the project last August. Then, a month later, he popped back into Discord to praise an anonymous angel investor for fully funding the difference needed to continue development and work resumed on the project. Kira TV, a YouTube indie critic, supposedly spoke with this anonymous investor. The video link is in the description below. Despite this surprising turn of events, Titan Reach ceased development again a week ago. Unravel declared a depletion of funds while digressing about an apparent NFT integration he wanted to pack into the game. Naturally, 
The NFT announcement was as shocking to the community as the sudden stoppage of development, and outrage soon followed. The backlash was so severe in some cases that threats of doxing emerged. Soon after, the game's website and associated social media accounts went pretty much radio silent. Evidently, the anonymous donor pulled their funding after about 150000 ended up on being blown on crypto investments and the purchase of a Tesla, with evidence shown in Discord exchanges. Again, video link in description below. The plot thickens as it turns out the mystery investor turned out to be a South African crypto entrepreneur named Andre Kronje, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, who alleges that Unravel attempted to bribe him into not investigating why he pulled his funding. Unravel and other developers have since also gone completely radio, radio silent, and no one else has spoken out since the story came to light. This is an all too familiar story that will give many other backers a sense of deja vu. But the biggest difference between Unravel and Chris Roberts is that only one of them actually got caught with smoking gun evidence. This is what happens when you're a greedy piece of shit who loses sense of direction when you're riding the momentum of the cash sled under your ass. This goes to show that money blinds crowdfunded men just as badly as corporate ones. Now on to everyone's favorite corporate punching bag, Electronic Arts. Oh no, what have they done now? A lot in the past few weeks, it seems. I'm sure everyone's aware of the most recent news of them blaming Halo Infinite for why Battlefield 2042 is a total dumpster fire. I'll wait for the rest of you to stop laughing. So it's no surprise that Battlefield 2042, much like prior Battlefield entries, knows its share of cheaters. But did you know that in EA DICE's efforts to crush the cheater rebellion, they were instead banning whole swaths of players using solely RGB software? You know, the pretty colory lights on our devices and peripherals that come with most first and third party hardware these days. Yeah, and it's probable they banned more RGB users that were legitimate players than they did actual cheaters. Never mind that its population is in such drastic freefall that both Battlefield 5 and Battlefield 1 have higher peak player numbers. Put it this way, peak players have gone from 100k at launch in November to just a hair over 8,000, about 8,008 mind you, in the last 30 days. At this point, shouldn't we just let the dumpster fire run its course? At this rate, there will be just 16 players sitting in a lonely infinite queue by April 1st. Wouldn't that just be a dandy thing to report on April Fool's Day? You know, for the most part, the quarterly earnings statement for EA at year's end was actually pretty good. Except for, you know, that Battlefield 2042 did not meet expectations. Uh, uh-huh. You don't say? I mean, basic features like a scoreboard get delayed to March, and over 200,000 players have signed a petition demanding refunds, and apparently this is the fault of COVID in Halo Infinite. For one thing, while both games are first-person shooter games, each title largely attracts specific demographics looking for a specific type of engagement. To blame a broadly disparate gameplay experience to the complete failure to hit a target that was once a major hit, <clears throat> Battlefield 3 and Battlefield 4, is just a total lack of ownership. Other studios endured the trials and challenges of the pandemic environment, delayed to polish it they needed to, and released, in many cases, superb titles. These trite statements are growing pretty fucking tired. And even the most basic consumer can see right through them. Naturally, the damage control response by EA Communications Vice President John Reesberg is the typical corporatees of these stories are not accurately capturing the discussion and the context, which was an in-depth and very humble internal conversation about the recent Battlefield launch. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay, sure. You're gonna have to do a lot better than that. We're used to the puffed-up suits from EA fencing us instead of talking straight. You can't blame that people working from home during the pandemic or why Battlefield 2042 failed. It's a multiplayer game with no single player or sandbox element to speak of. If a once independent studio like Bungie can support live service sandboxes like Destiny 2 largely from the comfort of their own homes and publish banger after banger in seasonal content and what will likely be a banger of an expansion on Tuesday, then a heavyweight like EA has absolutely zero excuse for not adapting and adopting strategies that worked for so many other studios whose developers release stellar titles from the comforts of their own collective homes. Period. Well, that'll be it for me, Outlaws. There's still more to come this weekend, so stay tuned for a breakdown of Thursday's TWAB from Bungie on the numerous Gambit changes that I'm thrilled to experience in just a few days, as well as a TLDR breakdown of this year's Ewok Festival of Love and SWG Legends. 
As always, your viewership is quite enough for me, but any support you can provide goes the extra mile that keeps this outlaw going during this very difficult time. So until next time, outlaws, I'll see you at the next one. Suddenly, shut up!